have stuck uh, program for a long time, right? So the first line over here is, you know, I'm glad to make the interesting kind of medicine for a lot. I'm going to access the HDFA so far. And in the far, I'm going to find this lens. I uh, find this also the forms and log file. I found the all of the other lines. Yeah, lines. And from the other then I'm going to count how many other counted through how many other counted by. Okay? So, in order to do this, they have the basic concept for the uh, for distributed data sets and for the IDD. So the logic is the concept is you want to model your students as a processing of this. And the processing logic is uh, defined by a sequence of the transformation and the actions. And the logic is in like the filters, you know, math, so the cache, you know, those are the, the transformation functions. And then if it has a building capability for failover. So just like so you know some node failed, you know you want to be here, as if the system should be covered by itself. And then another interesting thing they did was to say, be able to enable you to control when you want to cache in your data. So the thing over there, like you find all the error messages, then you say, I'm caching that error message, all the error messages. Right? So then what's going to happen here is to say, your first, so the other line was going to execution is you know, define this sense. When you do the, the first log, when you try to count the number of the data messages with the tool, it's kind of you know, doing all this job for you. So once you have all the things in the cache, when you do the bar from the data effects, there's everything in the cache. Okay? So those are the basic of this bar. Then the in order to, uh, for Yahoo to bring the Spark onto our Hadoop cluster, we decided to contribute to a piece of technology called the Spark on here. So in the, over the last few uh, months, we have uh, been making a lot of progress here. So if you see the, you know, for the folks, you know, you can check out the latest of the Spark with all of the enhancements in the for you. Right. So this is like, you know, it is a, uh, yeah. But, you know, yeah, I, I guess you know, I'm really needed to be too much deeper into it. So the intention here is to uh, enable Spark program, you know, without the application developer's knowledge, having it left with lots of features built in. So here is some video explanations about this, uh, Spark on your so you write your Spark on Yang, a Spark on application. You're going to say, using our Spark on Yang since you're going to launch your Spark on application. What's going to happen is say, you will have to do Yang the source menus, and you're going to ship your code over to find some, some machines in that Yang you know, cluster. And on that then you're going to launch the same called Spark application master. And with that, you're going to start running your code. And then maybe maybe the review allocate additional machines for distributed computation. So all of the what magically happening over there without you, you know, secure all the machine for you. So that's the basic model you're going to have. Then the another model you could have potentially use it would be called the client model. So what it is that enable you to do is you run your Spark applications and also enable you to access local resources, including you. So for example, you could do that in the Spark, that's called Spark Shell, and here you could like line by line, you know, do all those things as you like. So you're going to do your experimentations with that, you know, result, you know, and, 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 and challenge at all. And then, you know, there's additional stuff we are keeping working on at Yahoo to uh, make this Spark on Yang even better, right? So for example, at this point, Spark on Yang is mainly designed for running the batch uh, operations. Even so with the client model, now we have this uh, interactive capability. 
And the reason that some of the work we needed to do were like enable the long running job of the spark on the Hadoop. So that we would be going to working on in the in the Q1 2014. This this is that what we're going to enable you to do is to run your shut up, shut, you know, spark streaming, those many, many additional stuff in here. And we're also going to integrate the spark with the Hadoop history servers. So that you know after you're running out of the job, you know what happened in your history. You could compare all different runs of your Spark program to see, you know, how different settings you you change, how do they impact your execution. Okay, so let me just wrap up. And so I think you know, as mentioned earlier, in through this talk, I hopefully it's clear. Hadoop is the core of the Yahoo for a big data process. But on the other hand, Spark is joining that game, having fun with the group. And for us, it's really, you know, some of the iteration processing things, such as machine learning, is uh, Spark one of their major role. And in the, over the last several months, Yahoo has uh, made a significant contribution to the Spark. We plan to continue to Thank you. All right, if you have any questions, just raise your hand.
everybody in the office says they, they sit far, far away from me because every time I, they're very sick of hearing about a opt-in to do I'm very loud and talk to the customers constantly. So I'll give you a little bit of an overview about Swamp. Up, oh, louder? Okay. How about now? All right. All right. So how many people here have heard of Swamp? Most people? A lot of people. Good. A lot of people not. That's, that's a good opportunity as well. Splunk's about 10 years old. We were founded uh, in 2004, first release in 2006. Uh, we've got over 6,000 customers. Uh, we're a publicly traded company as of last year. Uh, we'll hit about 300 million ish in revenue this year, about 800 employees, a little bit over 800 employees. Uh, growing quickly to 1,000. We're, we're growing like gangbusters. I've been here about two years. The company's more than doubled since I've been here. Uh, and we're continuing to, to add new products and new features. So. We've got a couple of different products we want to talk to you about today. Um, one is Swamp Enterprise. Uh, Yahoo is a customer. I'm sure there's a, a lot of Yahoo's here that, that may have seen the product. Um, and we've got, you know, like I say, customers all over the place. We have use cases that, that range pretty far across the gamut of, of IT and data and looking at, at time series machine data. Everything from application development, application management, IT operations, security, compliance. We got started by IT guys who knew how difficult of a problem it is to manage thousands of servers, large amounts of infrastructure, complicated applications. Uh, and so we took a, a look at the problem and started intensely to start with on log files. Log files have uh, some intrinsic properties, things like timestamps and things like uh, the ability to, to carry human readable messages, but also machine readable messages as well. As well. But getting at that data is a difficult uh, problem. And also, we started to see an emergence of this same sort of problem in the Hadoop space. We have a second product that we've released this year that we're here primarily to talk to you guys about, which is called Hunk. And Hunk takes that same sort of Splunk approach towards machine data and puts it to work uh, on top of the data you put at rest in your uh, Hadoop file system. HDFS primarily, but, but pluggable file systems are, are also reporting. And in those types of use cases, we see people using it for large scale batch analytics, product analytics, security use cases, I'm dumping terabytes of log files into Hadoop. I want to be able to easily uh, analyze all those log files and get value out of, out of that data. And so what's different about us, right? We, we, like I said, we were built by IT guys for IT guys. Before I came to Splunk, I ran IT operations for a telco uh, in the United States. So I'm a product manager today. Two years ago, I was, I was running a, a data center full of thousands of servers and really complicated applications. You do this all in one code base, you can run this on your laptop, you can go download the product off our website today, install it on your laptop, start throwing data into it and analyzing that data, and that same exact set of bits that you download will scale to customers who are ingesting uh, upwards of 100 terabytes a day and storing petabytes of data at rest in our distributed clusters. We're an open architecture, it's easy to get data in, it's easy to get data out. The entire, for example, the entire UI is built on top of a set of APIs that we publish. So you can do anything inside of the software programmatically or do it throughout with our user interface, which makes us very flexible and extendable. And we scale incredibly well up to thousands of nodes and uh, taking in data, ingesting data, indexing and storing it. So a little, something's a little bit special about Splunk. What make, what's kind of, kind of our secret sauce, right? So if there's one thing that's incredibly special about Splunk, it's how we think about data. We think about data fundamentally differently than the way most people think about data. When you're ingesting log file data, you don't control that format. The format was dictated in advance by the time you come to consume that data. There's a huge amount of value in that data. And if you can solve that problem, you can then solve problems like how do I ingest structured data like JSON and CSV. And we take that same approach to polystructured data, semi-structured data, and, and completely unstructured data. And we do that by extracting key value and structure at search time. And this is a fundamentally important principle to the way we look at data. There's tons of gems hidden in this data. If you look at this just example of data, there's a bunch of key value data that's stored inside of that log file. This colon that, this equals that. These are key values that are, that are parsable, and, and, and you can read them as a human, but you want the machine to be able to understand them as well. And so we, we can pick up on a lot of that structure automatically. If you can't pick up on the structure automatically, you can configure as with regular expressions, with uh, delimiter-based parsing, easy methods of extracting the structure from this unstructured data. 
And we do all of it as we're reading the data. And that's fundamentally important because what that gives us the ability to do is simply with a configuration change, change how we're looking at the structure of that data. Parsers are rigid, brittle, and inflexible. Everybody who's written a parser knows that the next time the log file comes around and somebody changes the format, it breaks. And if you have a schema inside of a database, an origin schema, and you try to insert that, you want to add one more field, well, now I have an altered table, and I have to go back and do change control through four different environments and manage all my schema. We don't do that. We have what we call uh, uh, schema on query, schema on fly, schema on query we just came up with today. Uh, it's, it is the ability to look at structure entirely at query time. So the table that we're building internally as we're creating this data is entirely based off the data we're returning. So if I have a table with a thousand fields and I query the data and there's a new row with a different set of fields, I'll have a thousand twenty-five fields, right? It's, it's completely built. So you don't need to know anything in advance when you write your queries. You don't need to know anything about the structure. It's full text search. I go in, I start searching, I get my structure back, I can start working with it. And we, made, and we turned that into a powerful, easy to use interface for everyone, right? So uh, in this case, uh, we're addressing a technical audience, so you're kind of like, ah, pivot, Excel, et cetera, who cares? But it's awesome, like you can take complete raw data that you ingest in the product and you can turn it into structured Excel-like experience without doing any, no parsing, no schema, no ETL, no databases, uh, no reporting tools literally stuff raw data into the product, do a couple of extractions, or if it's things like JSON, we'll handle that automatically, or XML, et cetera, and you can immediately turn that into easy to use and analytics for you know, people like me, product managers, I'm increasingly technical, but let's just assume we're not. Um, and people who can, uh, who can look, need to look at data through a slightly, let's say, less technical user we can also do this in a role-based way, so we can create dashboards and charts and graphs and analytics on top of the search interface very, very quickly and do that in a very role-based way so that the right person has access to the right data. <coughs> so two kind of products, we're going to talk more about Hump. Ledeon's going to, my principal architect's going to come up in just one second to talk about Hump. Splunk Enterprise is a managed experience. So we'll kind of draw the line between what is Splunk Enterprise, what is um, fundamentally the same user experience from a UI perspective. Splunk Enterprise is indexing that data, storing and managing that data. So Splunk Enterprise has a concept that's a forwarder, that's our agent that runs out on your machines, tails the log files, looks for new data, brings data back to the indexing tier. The indexing tier indexes the data, creates an inverted index with lexicons we can easily go find, all the terms that you're looking for and where that data is located. And we manage that data. We allow you to manage that data in storage tiers, what's being written now, what may be cold storage, so you can put that on cheaper tier two, tier three type storage. All of that's sort of in the box. That's all in the product. With Hump, uh, obviously we're at Yahoo, you know, that's about 35,000 servers, hugely successful Hadoop environment. You've kind of figured that out. You figured out how to get data into a data storage mechanism into Hadoop. So Hunk is sort of the opposite, where we're going to take the power of that search-based query, that term extraction, et cetera, and put it to work with data that you're already managing, you're already putting at rest. So point it at your Hadoop cluster, uh, uh, turn it on, get it up and running. And uh, let's see, yeah, so that's Hunk. So without further ado, I'm going to bring Lenny on up. Uh, Lenny on's going to tell us all about the, the architecture, because Hunk's really cool. It's implemented on top of raw map reduce and HDFS, et cetera, so it should be a pretty cool deep dive. Thank you, man. How you guys doing? Can you hear me alright? Can't really hear you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, alright. Uh, so we'll talk about Hum. Um, again, I'm Chris from Hum. I've been there for about six years, but you're not here to uh, hear about me. Um, so with Hum, we set out to solve a, a pretty simple problem. Um, there's, there's a ton of data in Hadoop. Alright. You guys don't hear me alright. Oh, no. Alright, I'll just hold the mic in. Um, so the problem that we're trying to solve with Hunk is, is fairly simple. Uh, there's a ton of data in Hadoop. It's fairly easy to get data in Hadoop. That's, that's not the problem. The problem is actually getting value out of the data that you're actually throwing into. But let's see, what, what do I mean by value? There's a, lot of, there's a lot of definitions of what people mean by what they say about extracting data from, extracting value from the data. 
usually this is the, the way that this is the path that, that people uh, or the journey that, that data raw data goes through. First you collect data from whatever it rests, and then you, you have to go through this preparation phase, which is pretty uh, pretty gruesome. You have to parse the data, you have to remove all the noise, all the data that's, that's not formatted, maybe you can extract fields, put it in the table or wherever you're going to put it up. And then at some point you're going to end up asking uh, questions of the data. Usually the last phase is where actually people get most of the value from, from the data. Getting value out of the data is simply being able to get answers from the data. Asking it different questions, questions that you knew at the time you were collecting the data, preparing the data, as well as questions that come up after you actually, after you started answering some of those initial questions. So ideally you want something that looks like this, right? You want to, you want to spend a little bit of time collecting the data, some time preparing, obviously you're not going to get preparation for free, and then keep on asking questions iteratively um, on trying to get, get asked to uh, as many questions that you have. So, uh, as I like mentioned, we have solved this problem with the Splunk, we've solved it with query nested data, low data areas. We, we end up seeing customers having thumbs with different uh, low formats. Uh, so, we handle data collection, the wide variety of parsers, and, and, and cleansing of the data, uh, search time schema, and the ability to, to, do, to go all the way from parsing the data to query the data to all the way to visualizing and sharing and collaborating with, with each other on, uh, on how you. Uh, how you ask the questions of this data. So now, wouldn't it be cool if we could actually do the same, put an interface in this data, uh, put the same Splunk interface on top of the data that you already have in, in a dupe, right? So what if we could marry the dupe with Splunk? And well, we've done that, and we call it prompt, right? That's, that's where the name comes up. A lot of people ask us about how you guys uh, came up with this name. And some people like it, and some people don't. But, you know, I personally like it. Um, so uh, again, uh, uh, Honk is a, uh, it's an analytics, it's a full integrated uh, analytics platform on top of, on top of Duke. It allows you to explore the data that you have in Duke, uh, analyze the data, visualize it in the dashboard, and it sits straight on top of, uh, on top of Duke. And the only two dependencies that we have uh, is a file system and a MapReduce. Now a file system could be an HDFS or any other possible uh, file system that you're using in, um, in, uh, in Duke. This is how the, uh, the architect record looks like. So we have a Splunk D quarter server. Uh, this Splunk D quarter server, which is sitting at the bottom of, uh, on top of any uh, Linux operating system, has an interface uh, for interacting with the two. Um, you can interact with as many clusters as you want. You can correlate data between clusters, between uh, the two clusters and Splunk Enterprise, uh, or between the clusters themselves. On top of this uh, uh, core server, we have a, uh, a REST API. This is what Clint was mentioning, that anything that we build on top of all the visualization libraries and, and all the visualizations we have on top of all Splunk are done through this, uh, this REST API. You can extend and use that as well. There's a command line, there's an OTPC driver that we have for interacting uh, with Splunk. So therefore, you can add an OTPC driver to, to uh, talk to Splunk, which you can end up um, talking to. On top of that, there's Splunk Web, which is an interface that, you're, uh, that, you're, that, that people are logging into, and I'll, I'll show you the demo real quickly. And um, so I'll, I'll go through this pretty, uh, pretty fast, and I'm going to spend a little more time on, uh, on the demo. This were some of the goals that we're, uh, when we were building uh, Hunk, we were uh, trying to solve uh, some of these problems, and were some of the goals. So it has to process data in place. There's no way, uh, as the speaker before us mentioned, there's no way uh, you can analyze tons of data with the with moving. You have to process the data in place. We have to maintain full support for what has to be honest, it's one processing language, which is a pretty rich language. Uh, we have a true schema on read to basically apply on every search to be, to be able to, to change the schema and how you look at, at how you look at your data. And overall, we want to make this experience as interactive as possible on top of it. Right? And this is something that, that I want to spend some time uh, in. Uh, this is one of the challenges that we've actually ended up solving. It. This is where we spent most of our time. Um, so as you know, no one likes. So if you go and interact with, with some uh, some tool, you don't want to uh, stare at a blank screen. You, know, you write a you write a question. You know, you don't want to imagine if you went on Google, you typed in something, and Google said, "Hey, come back in ten minutes, I have an answer to it." Right? No one would use that. Um, however, we're building something on top of the system, which is which is a batch system. It's, it's not built to to allow interaction. It's not built with that thing. In mind. Um, so in order uh, to solve this problem, we, we looked at, 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 at the way that people, or at the way that we can process data. So fundamentally, our the problem that we're solving is uh, 
processing data and being able to process massive amounts of data uh, fairly quickly. Right? So there are two models of, uh, of computing and processing data. One is move your data to the computation. Right? So you, we call this a streaming model. A streaming model. So uh, you fetch data from the very rest, process it in a streaming fashion, and visualize the results. Anybody can see a problem with this? It's pretty heavy, right? It's pretty heavy and there's pretty low bandwidth on how much data it can cost. You know, you're going to end up at being the model that we need to answer. Right? Second model is the demand reduced model. Who is the computation to where the error sites? Monitor, you know, how, you know, monitor the course with this matter. Do job, pick up the results and visualize it. Somebody see a problem with that? Nope. Latency.